<laughs> well, welcome. My name is Jason Watson with WCG Incorporated. We're a local tax and accounting firm here in Colorado Springs. Um, paired up with Bud Rainsberger, right? Is that your Correct. Look? Yeah, it's a tough one. I had yeah. to practice it. Um, Bud, you are with RWA Partners, right? and they are what? An RIA, a registered investment advisor? We are firm? RIA with the SEC. Yep. Have been since 1990. Great. Yeah. And we are here on our bourbon and business tour, if you will, our podcast tour at Axe and the Oak. Maggie and her wonderful staff have been gracious to host us here, and we thank you for that. We also thank you for the bourbon on the rocks. It would not be bourbon and business without some bourbon. Um, but tell us a little bit about who you are and what RWA does. And you know, from a business perspective. Sure, well, we kind of got started, again, 1990s when I started my firm, I go back uh, to the early 80s, you know, the old traditional stockbroker kind of guy, young guy, stocks and bonds, real estate. Um, Making cold calls on the phone? I, I did, actually. I got paid $800 a month for three months, and then <laughs> they gave me a desk and a phone and said, you know, good luck. Um, so I worked hard at that, and, you know, kind of, made a good uh, good living and, and uh, kind of honed my craft for about seven or eight years with a couple of good firms. And then uh, really with my accounting background, I was really fascinated with financial planning <clears throat> and uh, portfolio management. So I, when I started my firm, we went fee only. We really wanted to be aligned with the client. So no commissions, no sales gimmicks or right. anything like that. You know, strictly uh, finding solutions. And we really uh, started with legal pad uh, financial planning early, you know, early 80s. It's been a while. Right. And, uh, and just really kind of grew that side of our practice. So everything we do today is planning based. It starts out with the plan and then it helps us figure out how we can help them, whether it's investment management and some of the other things that we do. Talk about that for a little bit, because I believe that's where most people fail is fail to plan, right? Right, plan to fail, fail Yeah, to exactly. Yeah. And, you know, people will tell me, hey, I'm, I'm maxing out my 401k, right? right? I'm like, that's great, what's the objective? And they're like, what do you mean, what's the objective? I'm like, what's, what's the plan? Right. You know, um, so, so tell us a little bit about the basics there and why that's the, the most critical first step. You, you know, we, we kind of have evolved, and I think what you really want to do is get a client to say, where do you want to be? Right? Where do you want to be today, tomorrow, 10 years, at some point in time? And then what do we have to work with to figure out, are you there yet? Budget. And, you know, so it can help solve for X, Y, Z, and W, right? How much should I be saving in my retirement plan? Hey, I'm putting all this money away in a 401k. Well, is it too, not, too much or not enough? Right. You know, are you, uh, do you have really big tax issues or should you take advantage of the Roth when you're young? Right. Um, and then, you know, it helps also start to develop how aggressive should my investment portfolio be? Right. What tax brackets am I at? You know, just it all starts coming into play. It's as complex as a tax return or as simple as a tax return. Yeah. Um, so for us, it really starts learning more about that individual, which is how we kind of got into more of some of that business planning that you're talking about and, and uh, just learning the craft and how to create solutions. Yeah. And I see that all the time, too. When I talk to, to people and say, hey, you got to go talk to Bud and his team and get, get, get the plan going. They, they look at me like, what do you mean the plan? I'm like, well, we're going to, not we, Bud and his team are going to develop this plan, this projection. They're going to analyze what you need, where you are, where you want to be and all that. And if everybody signs off on it, if I sign off on it as your CPA, Bud signs off on it as your advisor, you, your family sign off on it, then it becomes the measuring stick. Then we tape that to the refrigerator and say, have we met our goals? Have we met our objectives? Yes or no? Because right. uh, just to throw some cash into a retirement account, boy, it's dangerous because you could either, like you said, end up with not enough. Now you're living under a bridge in a box, right? Or you're 85 years old with five million bucks in the bank and you don't have enough time to spend it or enjoy it, or do with it what you want it. Or, well, or that's kind of, you know, exactly. So in our planning, you know, process, when we sit down with clients, we're really helping clients decide, should I renovate the home? Should I remodel the kitchen? How does that impact? Because typically one of uh, the, the, the clients, the prospects or whatever we're talking to is a saver and another's a spender, sure. right? You've never been there before. Sure. You know, it's like the sardine and the, the potato chip, but... Uh, <laughs> But the reality is, is you're trying to help them make good decisions. 
And so many times, like the one goes, well, if I do the remodeling, it'll cost 30K or whatever the number is, and now we're not saving enough for money, and this causes this friction in the family. So we go, well, wait a minute, let's see. Uh, you're saving X, and you're going to go spend this money, and we can show them on the plan. It doesn't change the date of their retirement, right? Correct. And so now we can kind of help them navigate, oh, so if I finance this for six months at 1.9% and paid off the remodeling and kept my saving in place because I have cash flow to do the other, I haven't really changed my financial life very much. And I agree 100% with that. I tell folks all the time, the worst thing is to have 50, 80, 100 grand in the bank and have no idea what it's for. Right. You know, is it for taxes? Is it for retirement? Can you go do that kitchen renovation? You know, right. and, and to have somebody have anxiety, let's say they do have 100,000 in the bank, which is a lot of money, and they're afraid of writing a $30,000 check for some new cabinets, they might actually be right. They can't afford those cabinets, but they might also be able to afford $50,000 in cabinets, right? So now we have this anxiety because of the unknown. Right. right, right. You know, um, validating a lot of the things we're trying to do in life, whether it's the second home, you know, can we really afford that? And I go, or, you know, should I pay off my mortgage? I probably, you know, we get that 10 times a week. Sure. And, uh, and we basically say, well, I can give you a lot of financial reasons why you should or shouldn't. But if that's your number one goal in life is to pay, be debt free, let's do that. Let's sure. figure out how to do that. And then we can figure out the rest of it that comes to play. Sure. No, I agree hundred percent. Cause if you look at it, you know, just simply, you know, if your rate of return is higher than your cost of debt, you should never pay off debt. Right. right. And that's <clears throat> an oversimplification, but if it makes you feel good, if it reduces your therapy bills, <laughs> you know, if it allows you to get a good night's rest, you can't have a dollar sign on that. Right, you right. Know. And you know, the nice thing is we have a software available that we use today that can actually show the clients, those of us who are number, you know, geared towards numbers, right? Right. We can go, okay, here's one scenario where you paid off the debt and then you took some of that income or that cash flow that you were using to pay off the debt and you started saving it and this right. is what it looked like. Or what if you kept the date and saved a little less and then it was paid off in seven years, we can see the actual number and impact. So you can do scenario A, B, and C. Which one do you like the best? Right. You know, you throw some risk at it, some Monte Carlo analysis and- Bingo. Yeah, and yeah. figure it out. So that's basic financial right. planning and all yeah. that, that everybody on the planet should do. Right. Tell us how it changes or, or maybe expands or whatever when it comes to a business owner. This is our bourbon and business tour, right. if you will. So <laughs> tell me how, like, hey, bud, that sounds great and all, but what does that mean for me, the business owner? Sure, well, you know, you, you always try to separate personal from business. <laughs> and we know that just never <laughs> happens, right? So, you know, you might tr set a truce when you come home at night and agree not to talk about business, but that doesn't really happen very often. Do you either. work with your wife? Oh, uh, no, fortunately. Yeah. But uh, It's impossible for Tina. She and has I. her business. I have my business. <laughs> we, we share things, but not a lot at home at night. That's family time. But when you sit down to do a financial plan and you're talking with a business owner and their spouse, right? it becomes jumbled. It's not easy to separate business and personal. Okay. So really when you're trying to figure out what are my personal goals, a lot of it is hinging on what happens in the business. How do I distribute cash? And, and, and what happens over the years is we see a lot of things happening on the business side because planning means gathering information. Right. And we go, oh, that's pretty inefficient. Or, you know, maybe have you thought about doing this? You know, so you start going from armchair advice to real advice. Okay. And that's how we've gotten to be more of an expert in, in, on, on business. And of course, you know, being a business owner uh, and actually having a, a number of businesses, I have a construction company with my son, Chris, that, okay. in, in Steamboat Springs. And so I know that side of the business Well, give really him a plug, well. what's his name? <laughs> his name's Chris Rainsberger. Okay. It's Eagle Mountain Builders. Eagle Mountain Builders, yeah. all right. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that part. And uh, of course, you know, when you're responsible for paying the bills and, you know, hiring and firing employees and things, you kind of have a different aspect that, I think a lot of advisors who work for a national firm don't get any exposure to that. I agree. And I believe, so, yeah, I would say that being relatable to the business owner, because as a business owner, 
you come running to me and you say, hey, Jason, I need that $10 so I can invest it wisely for you. And I'm like, but I need this $10 to build inventory. Right. You know, and most financial advisors will be like, okay, I, I, I don't understand your inventory concern. I do understand that your retirement concerns aren't being met. We need that $10 for, you know, for your retirement account. A guy like you will come in and go, well, let's look at your ROI, your return on investment on that inventory. Right. Yeah, you know, that, and, 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 and you know, sometimes I would say you probably have to sacrifice a little bit of long-term goals for the immediate so then you can meet long-term goals. Right. I mean, many times the best rate of return is on their investment, right? So I, I can't match that in a 2% interest rate world today, right? <laughs> it's just, it's so hard. Yeah, the best but, rates on their business, you're saying? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, so we go, why would we take money out of the business when it's growing at 20 or 30% a year or more and, and do something like, you know, building a tax-free bond portfolio? But then by the same token, we can go, hey, all your risk is over here in your business. Maybe we need to deleverage the risk over on your personal side because you're running that thing at 90 miles an hour too. Right. And the two shouldn't be, you know, running at the same speed. We need to figure out how to kind of put that back in balance. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of really sense. Important. I like that because, you know, if you're taking everything out of the business to, to pay for your lifestyle and you're not supporting your lifestyle with other income producing assets, you are too leveraged yeah we were or talking, potentially too leveraged we were talking earlier about some of our kansas heritage right and yeah. so i remember uh, driving in liberal kansas back in the day and seeing a bumper stick that sticker that still you know rings to me which it says please lord let the oil patch come back one more time <laughs> i promise not to piss it off right you right. know because we you know sometimes we take all the money it's like you know doubling down in vegas right right but let's take some of that and figure out what we can do with it over here that has less risk that I can turn to and use when things maybe aren't so good. No, I agree. Another concern that I have for, for business owners, and I see this in myself, I'm 47 years old, you know, I'm not there yet, but exit, I mean, nobody gets out of this thing alive, right? And so we're thinking about exit. And, you know, on my balance sheet, personal balance sheet, my biggest asset is my business and for most business Mine owners, too. yeah, for most business owners, that is going to be true. Um, we can't have this burgeoning asset that doesn't have an exit because then that $10 that you wanted that I said, no, I need to put that into inventory to grow this asset. That asset's only valuable if it can be sold or if it right. can be leveraged in some fashion right. away from you, you know, all that stuff. So that's a big risk as well. Would Absolutely. Yeah. And so when you're doing planning, you know, on the personal side, somebody comes in and says, well, I've got this dental practice and it's worth X. And you look at it and you go, well, it's probably about as inefficiently run practice as I've seen. You can't really tell the client that. But you go, you know, you really need to do some things to kind of get this baby ready for sale. Right. You know, like we've talked about. Or you have to go, you know, that million dollar valuation, let's discount that by pick a number. Yeah. 30, 40, 50 percent. Yeah. To Especially make sure if it's a liquidation right. versus an orderly sale. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and we've had, I've been around long enough, I've had clients pass away in the middle of their, you know, business careers and owning businesses and trying to untangle those, you know, uh, um, weaves, webs that they have uh, woven. So, you know, it's, it's really trying to take common sense, which seems to be lacking in a lot of part of the world today. Sure. But, and apply it to the things that we do every day. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's tough. So... Uh, so kind of shifting a little bit, you yeah. know, you, you sent me some notes and talk about the services that you can provide to to a business owner. And I, you know, I think I think, you know, financial advisor, planner, all that are very, very watered down terms. Right. Not everybody is the same. Um, I think you're probably one of the first ones I've met that focuses or has a strong focus on business owners. So tell me how you go, let's say, beyond the normal institutional financial advisor and really help a business owner directly. Right. Well, I think we just laid a little bit of groundwork, you know, about having, you know, some practical knowledge and experience in that yeah. area. Um, so we, we start out with saying, what, what are we trying to do here? And uh, in that business, is there extra cash flow? Should we, you know, do the demographics set themselves up for, you know, some uh, tweaking of a retirement plan design so we can pull money out on our pre-tax versus an after-tax distribution, right? right? 
um, uh, do we need to, you know, get the CPA air in here? Because a lot of times when we're sitting down talking about the personal side, they start sharing with us the fact that they do want to retire someday, right? Right. When you're a business owner, you're not telling anybody you're retiring, right? You don't <laughs> want the word getting out. Because my dad, he was, he was 52 years in coaching, and he used to say, hey, when a coach says he's going to retire in three years, you might as well just retire because right. you're done, right? Right. Yeah, kind, of, I, kind of dead man walking yeah, at that point exactly. a little bit. So, and I think a lot of times as business owners, once we kind of get into that mode a little bit, uh, we, we probably should uh, pay attention to help them transition as quickly as we can uh, and, and do as great a job as we can. So it's really trying to figure out from, from our perspective how we can help them uh, leverage their time to take on some of these other tasks, right? Because uh, we sit there as a business owner and we're putting out fires every day. We're not working on the business, we're working in the business. Sure. And so being able to delegate some of these items to, to a relationship that you have a lot of confidence in, I think is one of the things that we bring to the table. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, somebody asked me the other day, um, you know, how have I been able to get out of operations? So full disclosure, I signed 45 tax returns last year. Uh, so, <laughs> 45 which, more than me. <laughs> which is which is very, very poor, <laughs> bad performance. I, I, Tina should fire me if, if, <laughs> if the only metric was how many the tax returns I signed. But I'm working 100 hours a week, right? So what am I doing, right? Uh, so I'm doing a lot of other things besides operations mm -hmm. um, and production. So. People have asked me, how did you do that? How did you get out of operations? And I tell them the very first thing you have to do is give yourself permission. Right. You have to give yourself permission Dale say, and say it's okay mm -hmm. to do it. Um, and, and I think, you know, your expertise coming in to a, to a business owner setting and saying it's okay to let, to, to pull back a little bit, right. you know, and not have to touch everything that walks out of the door um, and help that transition you know, away from the business. I think, you know, for me over time, I've, I've learned uh, and I think gained enough uh, experience to be able to uh, talk with presidents and CEOs and so forth in a commonsensical, but this is what really you should think about doing. Yeah. I think when you're younger in your career, you don't have enough information or knowledge, you don't upset the apple cart, right? The client's right all the time. You right. know, it's like the king is not wearing any clothes, but everybody goes, oh, that looks wonderful on you today, right. sir. Um, and yet at the same time, I think, you know, a lot of us in our roles are looking for, how do I have a relationship with somebody who will tell me, I think you should really do X, not Y. Right. Or have you thought about going at it this way? Or, you know, maybe we need to really focus in on hiring your replacement. Right. Yeah. And so I've been able to do that in a number of instances where we were, were able to help them not only prepare for their own retirement, help the company get ready for sale, because whoever was going to acquire, in, in this case, this business, they wanted an experienced management team in place sure. to run it. An assembled workforce. Right. And if yeah. you don't have that, you're, you're not going to get full value. No. Uh, Absolutely. So it's just I mean, kind of learning like you have. You spend your day probably doing a lot of overlap to the things that we do. Yeah. No, uh, for sure. It, you know, that is what I tell business owners all the time, the first thing to do is give yourself, you know, authorization, permission to mm -hmm. get out of operations, get out of your own way, you know, get that assembled workforce right. into place. Um, you know, I'm out of operations, not because we're looking to sell WCG anytime soon, but just because I have other tasks and, right. and sitting down with people like yourself doing these podcasts, helping our viewers and listeners learn about some of the things that we can do beyond just normal tax returns right. is, is a lot of my day. Um, I see when people come to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about selling my business. You know, the very first thing I say, you know, like, is the timing right? You know, um, I see far too often business owners selling quickly mm -hmm. um, and they want the quick buck. You right. know, they, they see this big check that it could be dangled in front of them and they it just it's just instant wealth in their mind. Right. But I'm like, but at your burn rate, at your you know cash burn rate, you're not going to be able to survive very long. Right. Uh, <clears throat> it, 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 and the other thing with that is I see a lot of business owners kind of neglect how they can leverage their business. Right. You know, when, you know, times are hard, you can go work a little harder. You can go close more deals, you know. Um, hey, you bought that second home and now, you, you know, you're kind of feeling some cash crunch. You mm -hmm. put in some longer hours, right? When you sell your business, there is no more, 
longer hours. You right. can't create the piggy bank or you can't make the piggy bank swell. Right. Do you see that as well? Sometimes? Yeah, a, a lot. And we try to help them with kind of a come to Jesus type in, uh, environment where it's like, hey, hey, but I got this offer to sell my business for $2 million. Man, that's great, right? What am I going to keep on an after tax basis? Pick a number, a million five, whatever, right? Sure. Um, okay, so we're going to invest that in a 2% world, right? Sure. So I can Low get 2% in tax free bonds, and I put half of that in bonds, and I put some in stocks, and I buy some income producing real estate, so I'm getting about a 4% return. Uh, income wise yeah, 60 uh, on grand a, a one point five yeah sixty grand a year and and I go what do you need and he goes well I need two twenty because that's what I'm pulling <laughs> out of the business and I go you shouldn't sell that business right because you can't afford to do that right. but you know I'm tired and I don't have the passion or the energy that I really need and I go well we need to hire somebody to take a lot of the you know off your shoulders and, and what's wrong uh, with your uh, people <clears throat> talk about passive income all the time they talk about recurring revenues all the time. Your business can still do that right. without you in operations. Right. Give yourself permission to leave operations, hire that assembled workforce, right. and now your business is your passive investment. You, know, you don't it, need rentals now. You know? No. <laughs> well, you know, it's I nice mean, to could, have but, some, but you yeah. know, I've always, you know, we try to start helping our clients build income producing portfolios in their early 50s, right? Because yeah. by the time they're ready for retirement, you know, they've got a, a stream of income from their investments that doesn't include the sale of their practice. Right. So we can, you know, it makes it a lot easier to transition when you got enough set aside to do it. Yeah. No, for sure. <laughs> and it's a decision then based on when you're ready instead of having to. Um, there is some challenges because certain businesses can outgrow themselves to mm -hmm. the point where they can't be sold very easily. Right. Or your buyer pool is super tiny. And looking at CPA firms, you know, the sweet spot is that Five hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand dollar firm. You start talking about an eight, nine, ten million dollar firm. Your only suitors are firms in Denver. Big five. Yeah, yeah. you know, and they might not want you. They might not like your model or, or, or fit or feel like they that you fit into their portfolio right. of, of revenue. So um, if you do have someone that comes along, maybe it's five years too early, but someone does come along and says, "Hey, I want this whole thing. Is it for sale?" If that's well, we went through because... that with a client in Illinois, you know, Chicago. He has a, a paper box company, you know, and good old Midwestern getting, company. Yeah, you know, <laughs> getting stiffer, and he's made some major investments, and things are going really, really well. And a company that is a, a keen competitor of his came to him and said, "We we want to buy you," you know, and he goes, "If I don't sell now, I I could be out of business in five years." Sure. You know, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Um, and he said, I'm probably not going to like this because <laughs> I'm going to have to go work for somebody else. Yeah. And he goes, my memory of that was not very good. Um, but in the end, he ended, up, he ended up selling, yeah. you know, and uh, we helped him, you know, negotiate, I think, the best deal he could have gotten. Yeah. You know, making sure we, you know, had accounts receivable, including and who was going to make the payments on all the real estate and, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. And I think, you know, he could have gotten that from his accounting or, or what a relationship, but he just didn't have that type of relationship. Yeah. No, it's great. I mean, guys like you and I have to work together. I, right. I can tell you how the books look. I can tell you what the discretionary cash is going to look like. I can tell you about all the tax implications and all that, but you got to throw it at the budget. You got to throw it at their lifestyle. You got to throw it at their objectives, Right. you know, and, it, and everyone's got different legacies. Some people want their check to the mortician to bounce. Some people want to leave a million bucks behind for their church, whatever. I mean, right. everyone runs the gamut on that. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we try to accommodate. We at least show them what that looks like if they did that. Sure. And, and sometimes the plan works and sometimes the plan doesn't right. according to what they want. And so we go, well, these are the tweaks that you can make that will allow you to get there. Right. right. It could be spend a little less, save a little more. It could be work a little longer. It could be, you know, you tithe to the church at death instead of during the career to some extent. There's just a lot of different ways that you can kind of craft a plan that will get them there that doesn't look like the path they're on today. Yeah. No, for sure. Well, thank you for joining yeah. us. Um, we're going to be coming back um, here in a few minutes um, in another video and podcast on business selling, uh, right. selling your business. Uh, what does that mean? Um, and all that good stuff. Uh, my name is Jason Watson with WCG Inc., a local tax and accounting firm here in Colorado Springs, here with Bud Rainsberger of RWA Partners. Um, we're hosted by Axe in the Oak. They've been wonderful enough to open up their bar and 
give us some bourbon for our bourbon and business tour for our, our, our podcasts and our videos. So thank you, and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Great.